So then after 2017, I like decreased the volume each year and I've gotten better and better. And it's just more quality uh, in everything I do. It's not just about like getting over the rings and try to get up there. Uh, it's about all the small things like how do I, how is my body positioned when I'm swinging, when I'm kipping, what am I doing with my arms, what am I doing with my hip? If you have 20 transitions in a workout and you lose one to two seconds each time because you're walking and talking in that transition, that's like almost a minute. If I do my absolute best and, and get a fifth place, should I be disappointed then? Because I wanted to be top three. Uh, but I have given my absolute best and that's all I have, then I have to be happy. As in everything else, you need to be like, okay to fail, to be able to win. All right, Kristen, we are now on the podcast. How are you doing? I'm good. It's, uh, it's been, it's been a little battle getting you on, but it's always, it's always good. It means that you're busy and things are going uh, well. Maybe for the three listeners that don't know who you are yet, can you give us a brief background <laughs> on who you are and what you do? Yeah, um, retired CrossFit athlete uh, from uh, Norway. I've been, uh, I've been doing CrossFit since 2012. Um, been to the CrossFit Games eight times eight consecutive times um finished second in 2019 mm -hmm. and uh yeah 2021 was my last year as a competitive crossfit athlete and now now i'm coaching athletes i'm i have my own company cryo training um and a training program helping uh, younger athletes reach their potential um mm. so that's very exciting you said retired CrossFit athlete. Is that retired? The word, do you, do you have to repeat it to yourself to just stick with it? Do you have any, uh, do, do, would, you, would you want to go back to competition? Is that something you have to kind of fight against? No, not really. Like it's, it's sad to not be a part of uh, the athlete group uh, because I just love being a part of it and chatting with the other athletes and getting ready for a competition. So I have to admit that I missed that a little bit, but still, like I was at Lowlands, the, one of the semifinal uh, competitions a few weeks ago, and I was just not a one percent of me wanted to be on the competition floor. I was just so happy that I'm like I'm done with it. I've done my part, and now it was just super fun to like be a part of it on the other side, like being a coach and a spectator. And that was previous years, like I've I've said like I don't want to go and watch a CrossFit competition because I've I just want to be on the competition floor when I'm watching it. But now it felt totally different. And that's just a good feeling to have that. Okay, it was the right thing to do. Um, and now I'm just happy to be a part of it in, in another way. How has your day-to-day -day changed compared to, let's say, a year ago? I'm definitely not training as much. Uh, I don't take the time to train like for four, five, six hours a day. Now it's like one, maybe two hours a day. If I have time, I just, I love training. So I would rather go train than work. So sometimes I just do two sessions a day, but that's, that's very rarely, but trying to get some training in um, and then working um, a lot of different projects. It just takes a lot of time to like sit down and try to be creative figuring out how to do it the best way and stuff like that. So that takes time. Um, so it's been, I've been really busy. I have a lot of athletes competing and trying to get them ready for a competition and now up to CrossFit Games. So it's busy, but a lot of fun. Would you say that now you have a bit more time and you have to master some new skills for the, maybe the new life and the new kind of line of work that you're pursuing? Yeah, I don't have more time. <laughs> that's that's the problem. <laughs> I thought I was gonna have like a lot of time, but it's just what I'm doing now takes so much more time, and I don't really have time to relax anymore. Because if I have some free time, I feel like I need to work. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'm, I'm definitely working on like uh, 
creating a good structure for like for my days so I know when to work when I have time for training uh, and also when I have time to do nothing and uh, just relax so that's that, it's hard is that something you do quite easily relax and, and and do nothing or is it something you you have to kind of force yourself to do when I was competing I I was really good at relaxing uh, just laying on the couch watching Netflix uh, because I knew that that was a good like a big part of the recovery process so I needed to do that but now like I don't really need the recovery process <laughs> especially not my body my mind probably needs it but I I don't need it so I don't give myself that time uh, to actually relax but I I'm, I'm, will get better at it I have to <laughs> What parts of the new life as a as a coach, as a mentor, uh, and the many other hats that you're wearing right now? What parts of this new life are you enjoying the most, or maybe challenging to you, but that you that you enjoy going through? I do enjoy like taking all my experience from the past ten years of training and competing, and trying to figure out how can I pass this over to these athletes. So they don't do the mistakes that I did and like trying to figure out, okay, how to communicate this and how to get through to them. Um, it's challenging, but it's also very rewarding when you see that, oh, it actually helped them to perform better. Uh, so I think that's, uh, that's a really fun and um, rewarding like, thing to do now. And especially when you see that it's working, uh, it's really cool. I want to come back to your coaching and everything that you're doing uh, right now. But first, I'd like to talk a little bit about CrossFit as a, as a sport, uh, since you, you know, you've, you've known it from the competition side for, like you said, a decade now. How was CrossFit when you first found it? And how have you seen it evolve uh, over time? If you had to give a, a, a brief overview of essentially the evolution of CrossFit over the last 10 years for you from your standpoint. Yeah, when I when I started CrossFit, I feel like it was uh, it was really hardcore, and like you went in every day and you just gave a hundred percent effort uh, or whatever you got. Like you go hard every day, um, but I think like with the years, I think especially with the sport, like the competitive sport, growing like everyone understood that you can't go hard every single day. You need to have some kind of um, differentiation of how, like what you do day to day. If you go into the gym seven days a week, you can't do one really tough Metcon every day. You need to have like, um, some days are harder. Some days are like medium intensity. Some days are light intensity. And then maybe one day you just do strength um so i think that's changed and i think especially for our gym they like put in recovery days into the program too so thursdays and sundays you do uh, just ergs or you do like uh, lighter intensity and that's a part of uh the program for the week at the the gym that i'm at mm -hmm. so i think that's really good because everyone that goes into crossfit a crossfit gym wants to get better and they want to improve uh, and I think it's then you need to have some uh, uh, differentiation in the intensity that you do. Do you see that as being maybe a mistake that a lot of uh, amateur or beginner athletes still make of trying to go hard all the time? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, a lot of athletes think that more is better. That if they just can train more, they will get better. Um, but I did that like my pre the first years that I competed I was like oh I need to go from one session per day to two sessions per day and then I need to do more volume I need to go harder in every single workout but then I got to a point where it's just too much and my body was just wrecked all the time so then after 2017 I like decreased the volume each year and I've gotten better and better and it's just more quality uh, in everything I do uh, less volume uh, and my body have been feeling so much better throughout these years and I have I, I performed better mm -hmm. so I think to understand that the quality of what you're doing is the most important thing not the quantity 
was it hard to shift to doing less work? Did, did you, did, was it a kind of a, a bit of a jump for you, a bit of a commitment into the unknown of, okay, I'm going to try and do less and hope that everything holds together and I'm still going to be able to perform? It was a little, yeah, it was tough in the beginning, especially because you f well, I felt like I needed to do all the movements all the time. Uh, but then after I, like I had some injuries and I experienced that, oh, I didn't do muscle ups for three months, but uh, I got back and they were better than before. That's when I realized that, okay, I don't need to do all the movements all the time because they're there. You just need to like, if I spend some time visualizing them, um, they will be there when I get back. So that's when I realized that, okay, I don't need to do toast to bar each week because I'm pretty good at toast to bar. Maybe I'll do them every other week or maybe just once a month and stuff like that. But I need to work on the things that I'm not that good at more. And then the things that I'm pretty good at, I'll, I'll work on them enough uh, for them to be really good, uh, but that not more than I have to. So that helped a lot, but uh, it was definitely hard, especially in the beginning to decrease the volume. But once I felt that my body was feeling so much better, I was like, it's definitely worth it because I'll rather train a little less and feel that my body is really good and ready to train every day than waking up every day with like aches and pains everywhere. and kind of dreading to go uh, into the gym. You talked about the importance of quality uh, of movement and everything that you do in training. Like, can you talk about the, the technical aspect of CrossFit as a sport and all the movement that it involves, especially at the, at the elite level? What are the required? Can you give maybe some insights on a few key movements that like details that you think about that maybe others don't think are, are that important, but that you've kind of refined over the years uh, because you know how important technique is to perform at the highest level and, and stay efficient. Yeah. And, and when you mentioned that, I think that's one of the other things that has really evolved in CrossFit, like the technique, uh, like in the, in the early years, you, you can see some of like terrible techniques will be like people lifting heavy weights, but their back is really rounded and like this you like cringe when you see them do stuff because you think their body is going to fall apart but I feel like that's overall been so much better uh, I think coaches have been got, getting like so much more um, experience that they can see okay we want to do it like this and uh, and overall everyone is moving better so I think that's a really good part um, that's really good that that's happened the, the, mm -hmm. in the later years because now like the elite athletes, they move really well, most of them. So they can be good, uh, good role models too, to everyone out there that's doing CrossFit. Um, but yeah, for me, like I physically, I haven't been the strongest or the fastest or anything in the CrossFit world, but I worked so much on technique and like small details that I know can give like the extra percentage when it comes to performance. Um, so for example, like my muscle up, I really struggled with muscle ups in the beginning. Um, it took me probably like six months to get my first muscle up, but then it took me probably five years before I actually felt like I managed to do the muscle up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, because I, I never really took the time to to learn the basics and like learn how am I supposed to do the muscle up? What are the, the movements that are happening within the muscle up? It's not just about like getting over the rings and try to get up there. Uh, it's about all the small things. Like how do I, how is my body positioned when I'm swinging, when I'm kipping, what am I doing with my arms? What am I doing with my hip? how, which angle is my hip going to be and my knees and my legs, like breaking it down. So like in the end, I'm like, okay, I know exactly how my muscle up is going to look like and also going to feel like. Um, and then I had to start all over again because I had to start working on all those small details uh, and one at a time because you can't think about more than one thing at a time when things go that fast. So it took probably a year or two after that I figured out after I figured out how my muscle wanted to look like before I actually felt like, oh, that's 
now I feel it. Now I can do the muscle up that I want to do. How do you contend with the fact that during that process of evolution of, of learning, uh, of refining your skill in that case of the muscle up, how do you, um, maybe wrestle with the idea that, well, maybe that's a couple steps back I need to take in order to then be better in the future. But in the meantime, that also means that you're kind of, like you said, going back to the basics, maybe not training as hard as others might. Um, was that ever on your mind? Yeah, it was really tough because I, all I wanted to do was increase my max and broken muscle up. So like, I, I just worked on like, okay, I had 10. Okay, I need to get 11. And I didn't really matter. It didn't really matter how they looked like as long as I could get the 11th or the 12th. But I got to a point where I'm like, okay, I, I can do the 13 and broken, but I still can't do five by five. So, and that's more relevant in a workout. So I, I was like, okay, I need to do something about this because I don't want to go into workout being afraid of the muscle ups anymore. Mm -hmm. Because I was terrified, like my first five years of competing, I was just terrified whenever I saw the rings. I felt like they were controlling me instead of me controlling the rings. So I was just tired of that, being, being the victim of the rings. So I was like, okay, I need to take control of this. I want to be in charge, but I, I need to start from the beginning. And that was tough going back to like just doing swings. And then I was able to do singles. And then after several weeks, okay, we can go into doubles. And it was just, it was really hard, but it was so worth it in the end. Were there other movements that you had to really go back to basics with and almost relearn from scratch in order to perfect your technique and become that much more efficient that it could then make such a big difference in competition? Yeah, uh, especially my snatch was pretty much the same way. Uh, because I never really learned learned it like perfect technique for the snatch. I was just lifting and then I trying to lift heavier and then it just went on like that. Um, but eventually my snatch was just holding me back too much. So I needed to, to break it down and take a step back and start with the stick again. <laughs> and uh, because of my injuries and times where I haven't been able to lift heavy, that's where I've done a lot of work with a PVC pipe. And I think that's really helped me um, to learn the technique right. So I'm, I'm grateful that I had my injuries because that's giving me the opportunity to take a step back and relearn some of the movements. What movements in, that we know of uh, so far in the, in the CrossFit competition world, what movements in your opinion are still under exploited from a uh, from a standpoint of technical mastery by most athletes where should where can athletes still make some significant marginal gains on technique in uh, the movements that are going to be present in different crossfit competitions today well i think in most movements to be honest uh, it's very individual though like some are really good at some movements like really good technically mm. um others have a lot to gain to work on the technique um so I think like in everything, like for everything that involves squats, like how deep do you have to go? Like, can you, can you put your legs out wider so you, you don't have to go like that deep? Um, can you like for pull-ups, how much swing do you need to have? Like, can we, can we decrease the cycle rate, cycle time, mm -hmm. like with minimal time, but like if it's 50 reps, maybe that's like 10 seconds. Uh, and I think probably the most important thing is the transitions between movements. I think that's where most athletes have time to gain. Because like if you have 20 transitions in a workout and you lose one to two seconds each time because you're walking and talking in that transition, that's like almost a minute. Um, and that's like, think about stuff like that, that it doesn't require you to be better, to have more fitness. You just need to do it and you need to think about it before you start. So for me and my athletes, that's what I talk about the most, like transitions, 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 be fast, be efficient, know exactly how you're going to do it and what you're going to do in the transitions for each workout. Mm -hmm. 
I guess we, we're almost going up the, the pyramid of sports preparation. If we put physical preparation at the bottom, then we have the technical aspect. Then we have tactical or strategy. And then we'll, we'll talk yeah. about the mental aspect at the top a little bit, a little bit later, but in that strategy, um, let's say layer, what other things yeah. do competitive athletes need to think about uh, in order to, like you said, gain, gain a few seconds here or there, but that today make, can make a huge difference uh, on, the, on the competition floor? Yeah, well, I, uh, what I've done is like, I, I love breaking down the workout beforehand and I spend a lot of time preparing for the workout knowing like what are my strengths in this workout what are my weaknesses uh what's the time domain um what am I going to focus on for each movement uh how I'm going to break it up uh what am I going to do in the transitions what kind of equipment do I need if I need chalk where is the chalk going to be so I got to have it in my my tights or is it going to like lay down beside the bar um and how can I make up as much time as possible in these transitions? Did and you... then spending, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. And then spending time on visualizing uh, the workout, like several times, knowing when I walk out on the floor, I know exactly what I'm going to do because I've done it before. So it's kind of like, feel like a machine because you program yourself into doing it. And then you go out there and it's like, oh, yeah, I know what to do because I've done this before. Yeah, I think that's a very powerful insight that you just shared there, saying that if you're able to see it in your mind's eye many times and you've played it over and over, once you go and do it, you don't have to think much because you're already in no. uh, automatic mode and there's no surprises, right? Because you've probably yeah. visualized all parts of the workout. You go as far as thinking about the crowd, thinking about the noise, the lights, all of those things as well. Do you integrate all this into your visualization process? Yeah, uh, definitely for like bigger competitions, I always visualize myself out there and like hearing the, the noises and seeing what I'm seeing, like how is the light? Um, how does, the, what's the smell like? Uh, and everything, that I can possibly think of. Like I try to visualize that uh, and visualize myself out on the floor before I go into a competition. Is that something you've done for many years now or is that something that you've added more recently? I've done this since uh, 2013, since uh, my first regional or semifinal. And how, how has your process of visualization evolved since then? Um, well, in the beginning, it was really hard for me to visualize. Um, I struggle, especially like for my snatch, I really struggle to see myself make the lift. Um, so I've had a lot of, um, uh, challenging moments when visualizing the snatch, but eventually I figured that, okay, I had to like move a little bit around myself when I was visualizing so I figured eventually that I always looked at myself from one side but then when I switched to the other side I made the lift so it was something about like where I usually video myself and I always look at my video after and that was from that side that I was um, not visualizing myself from so when I switched sides it was like oh now I see now it's easier. So it's just small things like that, that I've experienced through the years that giving me like the, um, well, it helped me knowing that, okay, there's just some small things that I need to change to make, to make the lift. And that's been the same with muscle ups too, like trying to get into it. Sometimes I like, I need to step a little further away from myself. Like I always start from the top of the, uh, the arena so I don't really see my face that's when I start visualizing I see someone down there doing the things I want to see like a muscle up and then I go closer and then I can maybe see the judge next to next to the person I still don't see the face uh, and then go if I make it there like I make it look perfectly um, when I when I visualize it I go closer and I can maybe eventually see my face on it and see myself performing the perfect muscle up. 
And then if that's good, I go into it and I stand under the rings and I am doing the muscle up. And that's when it gets hard because that you have like all the feelings and thoughts coming in too. And that's challenging because in the beginning, I felt like the rings was controlling me. So it was like when I got in there and stood like under the rings and saw the rings, I was like, oh, wow, I got scared. And that, um, that affected my ring muscle up. But after doing this for years, I was like, try, I, I was able to have the control of the rings and I was able to jump up there and see and feel myself doing the, the perfect muscle up. So just like you need to put in the reps to perfect a movement from a technical standpoint, you need to put in the reps, seeing yourself executing those movements on the competition floor. Would you say that your skill of visualization has evolved and progressed over time? Yeah, uh, for sure. And I don't think I'm as scared of failing in like visual, visually anymore. So that makes it easier too when you're like, okay, if I fail, that's okay. I'll just take a step back and then we try again. But in the beginning, I was just terrified of if I fail when I visualize, I'm probably going to fail when I do it physically. So I was just scared of that, scared of the failure. But as in everything else, you need to be like, okay to fail to be able to win. That's a, that's really well put. So we talked about visualization. Does that fall under the umbrella of, of mental preparation in your book? Yeah, I would say combination of the tactical and mentally preparation. Uh, what other aspects do you like to think about when we talk about mental preparation for CrossFit athletes? Um, this is probably not just mentally, but I, I like to prepare like everything that I can before I go into competition. So I write, I make a, a schedule. So when I'm going to wake up, what I'm going to eat, when I'm going to go to the arena, uh, when I'm going to start warming up, what, what is my warm up? And it's timed. Everything is timed. So I know exactly when I'm doing the last warm up before you're getting corralled and go out to the competition floor, you know exactly what time that is. So it's like maybe like five minutes before you go. So you're warm and ready for the workout. And then you have to go back and say, okay, if I'm going to do that at that time, I need to start warming up at that time and make sure that everything is on time. And what am I going to eat after? Am I going to cool down? When am I going to start getting ready for the next, uh, next event and stuff like that? So if everything possible that everything that is possible to prepare is prepared you have so much more mental capacity if something unknown is happening so that's like for me that's helped a lot I know exactly what I'm gonna do at all times and then when I get there and something like oh we need to we need to change the times or this and this can't happen you have to do that and that it's like okay I have the mental capacity to, to handle that um, because all the other things are already planned and I just can move my warm up time by an hour or something like that. And so, that's one part. And oh, sorry. No, no, that's one part. I want to hear the other part. Yeah. And then, and, well, there's, there's several other parts, but uh, one thing that it helped me a lot is to focus on myself and my own performance. Um, in my first year of CrossFit, I was just. I was looking at who I was competing with and like looking at their PRs, what they could do. And like, I spent so much time analyzing my competitors that I didn't really have time to analyze what I could do. Um, and that like over the years, I learned that, okay, I need to focus on myself because that's the only thing that I can control. I cannot control anything, which judge I'm getting, uh, what the workouts are, what are my competitors doing? Uh, how's the weather like, uh, the sounds, noises in the arena. That's not something that I can control. So I just need to be prepared for that and okay with how that is. And then focus on my, uh, myself and my effort and how, uh, how I react to things that happen during the competition. Do you um, feel like, so that's, do you feel like you've gained more control on how you react to things over time by, by working on those different aspects of yourself? Yeah, uh, definitely. 
Uh, and I think also to, to have focus on the effort instead of the result and leaderboard have given me so much more joy uh, of competing. Because like in my first year, it was all about getting on the podium, like being top three. But that's like, it's out of my control. If I do my absolute best and, and get a fifth place, should I be disappointed then? Because I wanted to be top three. Uh, but I have given my absolute best and that's all I have. Then I have to be happy. Uh, and then I get the placement that I deserve. So just realizing that made everything so much better and just made competing easier because I didn't have to worry about where I placed. I just had to worry about my own effort. Uh, and if that was 100%, then that's okay. And I can be happy after and I'll get the placement that I deserve. What other aspects uh, did you want to talk about when it comes to mental preparation? I think those two are probably the two most important things for me, uh, having the right focus um, and do the preparations, but also having like trigger words or something that can give you the extra power uh, when you really need it. I, I have one example for from regionals 2015. Um, this was my second year. Uh, this was my my first regional after I qualified for the CrossFit Games for the first time. So I qualified in 2014 and going into 2015, I was so scared that I, that was just like one lucky shot that I was able to make it once, but I was not really good enough to do it one more time. So going into regionals, I was super nervous. I didn't have a lot of confidence. Um, so me and my mental coach, we, we figured that we needed to do something. Um, and then we pulled out the tiger. Um, so I brought a tiger. It was not a physical tiger. It was a mental tiger. I brought it into the corrals and I had it in like a leash. And then I pet it. I was like talking to it. it probably looked crazy. Uh, but then I brought it into the competition floor. I was still holding it. It was very eager to like go up and run but I was holding it back and then three to one go, I unleashed it and it was like me and the tiger um, got into one. And then this was, a, it was Randy. So it was 75 snatches for time. So it's a short workout. But when I finished, I, I've done this, I've done this workout like four times before this. Um, it was like a two minute, 30 second workout. I PR my time with 20 seconds. And on the finish line, I was like, wow, what just happened? I had no idea. It was just like, it was, it was amazing. I, I, I had no idea where I got that extra power from. But for me, that was from the tiger on that time. And that's something that I brought with me. I don't use it a lot, but I use it when I really need it. Um, and I think finding something that can give you the extra power, extra energy, when you're in like a dark place and you really need to perform, uh, that can help a lot. So now all those skills, uh, abilities that you've built over the years, you're now endeavoring to pass that on to, to others and try to help them realize uh, their utmost potential in competition. When did you start uh, coaching athletes on, on that aspect of their performance and why did you want to do this in the first place? I, um, there's been a lot of younger athletes in Norway that has been like really good, uh, coming up after me. Um, I haven't given them all my secrets until I was done last year <laughs> because of course I didn't want them to beat me. Um, but I like given them some tips and tricks throughout the, like the last years because I wanted them to be able to perform their absolute best too. And I saw their potential. Um, so the last year, last year of me competing too, I was like, look, watching people and I was like, oh, I really want to help you. And then, but now, no, I can't do that now because I have to focus on my own performance. But I, I found myself like in like, oh, I do want to help you, but I also want to help myself right now. So after I retired, I felt like, okay, now I have time and I really want to help these athletes and, um, I want to give them 
tips and tricks that I've learned that maybe can help them to reach their potential because I know how much the mental part can mean and uh, how that can affect your performance. So I just wanted to give them the opportunity to use the tools that I've been using uh, throughout the years and see if that can help them too. What's your process for introducing those different tools to a, an athlete that you start working with? Uh, do you have a kind of a sequence that you like to respect in terms of what you're going to work on first and then build up to something else? Or does it vary a lot from athlete to athlete? Yeah, it does. It does vary a lot from athlete to athlete. And I always ask the athletes what they think they should work on the most because it's up to them. I'm not going to tell them anything and I'm not going to tell them what they should do. It needs to come from them. Uh, and they need to understand, too, that I think that this can help me. If they don't think that this, the mental training can help their performance, I'm not going to do anything because it needs to come from them. Um, but they are all very eager to learn. And they all want to know what I did and how I did it. But I'm trying to find, like, get them to figure out how they can do it and how they think they should do it so i'm asking a lot of questions i'm not telling them a lot what to do what kind of a time commitment does that usually represent for an athlete that you work with in terms of uh is it a lot of you know time spent sitting down visualizing or prepping before uh maybe they do uh, one or two big workouts during the during the week as a as a competition simulation or, or a kind of a max effort, um, how, how do you structure it over, over a week? Maybe if you get to give us a, like you said, it's very individual, but a couple of different examples of, yeah. of, of athletes you've worked with. Yeah, it, it of course differs from athlete to athlete how much they want to work on it. Uh, but we, I try to get it into their training. So it's like a routine for them. Um, and yeah, the best thing is to like, we maybe have one or two competition simulation workouts during the week. So we start with them and then I, I, then I make them do this. So I make them like, uh, analyze the workout. Like I told you previously, like strengths, weaknesses, time domain, uh, how I'm going to do this, perform this workout transitions and everything like that. So they have analyzed the workout. They have a plan A, plan B, maybe a plan C, and then they have to send it to me. So I've seen it. Um, and then there I make them accountable. So they have written it down, send it to me, and then they know, okay, Kristen has seen it. And then when they get in there, uh, we maybe talk a little bit about, oh, is this a good strategy? What, uh, what are you going to think about during the workout? And if plan A is not working, when are you going to go over to plan B and stuff like that? Um, and then afterwards, we always analyze, okay, what went well? Always start with the good thing. And then even better if, what could have been better? And then we take that on to the next workout and learn from that. Um, so that's where we start. And then if they want to, they also visualize after they analyze the workout, they can visualize the workout um depending on how much time they want to spend on this but I've had a lot of good experiences both myself and with athletes to analyze workout visualize at least once maybe twice and then go in and do it and they just find it so much easier to do what they have planned because they have visualized it beforehand do, do you find that oh from your standpoint and from the perspective of your of your athletes would you say that it cuts down the margin between uh, a first uh, maybe test and then a, a retest shortly after or, or, or the next day. If we think about the open, for example, there's uh, still a lot of, uh, of athletes that like to, to do the workout twice because you can do it once and then you know where you can improve and then you do it again. Do you find that mm. the, the, the margin between those two, does that get reduced with a good uh, preparation and visualization in, in your opinion? Definitely. Um... Like from my experience, I've, I did that like the first years I like, I did it on Friday, the open workout Friday. And I was like, oh yeah, I learned this and this, I'm doing it again on Monday. But then eventually I got tired of doing it twice because you go all weekend dreading that you have to do it again on Monday. So I figured, okay, if I just do the, the preparations right, maybe I just have to do it once. And that makes it so much easier. So I started to do this before every single work, open workout. I spend 
several hours analyzing the workout. Uh, I went into the gym in the morning doing maybe like one or two rounds of the workout. So knowing just how it's going to feel like uh, and then visualizing it and then going into the workout. Then on Friday evening, I was like, oh, I, I know how this is going to feel. Uh, I have a plan and I can execute. And then 99% of the time it was like, okay, this is, this was my hundred percent effort. And maybe I can get like one more rep if I do it again, but it's definitely not worth it. So I felt like that helped me to get out my potential for that workout in my first shot, instead of having to do it maybe like 90% the first time. And then you go two days later, you have to do it at hundred percent, but then you're tired from the 90% effort. And then Maybe it's not getting better after all. So mm. I would definitely uh, recommend people to do this before they do an open worker so they maybe don't have to do it more than once. Yeah, like you said, you save a little bit of energy and in the end, doing it again might might not be the the, the best thing for you as an athlete in, in the long run. Yeah. So just like do it right the first time and do it properly. And do it with full effort so you don't have to go the whole weekend thinking about it, being nervous about it, and then you're having to do it again. And maybe you don't even do better. Kristen, it was a lot of fun uh, getting you on the podcast. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to come in and chat. Um, what do you look forward to in the coming years of this, this new career that you're developing? Um, I'm super excited to learn more uh, about how to coach athletes, both like physically uh, and mentally. I, I want to do like more individual programming and uh, being involved in athletes so I can do both like the programming, I can do the mental coaching, I can use my nutrition background uh, and try to like create like a package for athletes. Um, and I'm excited to see they grow as athletes and see they reach their potential because so many talented athletes um, out there and a lot of them that I work with, they, they can be really, really good. So I'm excited to, to watch them. Kristen, if athletes are interested to learn a little bit more about uh, what you provide as a service, where can they uh, find that out online? Uh, you can go to Krieger Training dot com uh, or found Craigie Training on Instagram or Holtic Kristen on Instagram. That's me. Fantastic. I'll put all those links in the description for uh, the listeners. Uh, Kristen, thanks again for taking the time. It was a pleasure. Of course. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you would like to support the podcast, please take a few moments to leave a written review and a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. If you want to watch this episode again, you can find the full video recording on my YouTube channel. You'll also find hundreds of hours of free content, all my podcasts, my thoughts of the day, structured presentations, and more. So don't wait, go subscribe, and I'll see you in the next episode. Take care.